Well, greetings and welcome to the study. We're going to be spending 10 times in this session with the figure of King David. David the shepherd boy become king, um, giant slayer, all kinds of things about David in these 10 weeks. Then we're going to look at Psalms. For 10 weeks, David, of course, wrote about half of the Psalms. Um, and we'll see how they reflect his life, his trials and his triumphs, the depths and the height of his faith. Then we're going to look at the prophet Isaiah. All of these kind of to um, see how there's so much in the Old Testament that prepares us for what Jesus is, what he means, what he came to do. We're going to start with David. And today we're talking about David's rise to power, his anointing by Samuel. David's story is found in 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings. So what you might want to do in preparation for this is read the first 15 chapters or so of 1 Samuel, just to give you a kind of a background for why the people of Israel wanted a king, uh, how he was anointed by Solomon, kind of against his will. Uh, and then that leads us up to 15 and 16, which is what we'll be looking at today. I'm going to be pausing a couple times during this video to have you read instead of have me read it to you. So if you want to prepare to put your video on pause while you read, that would be most helpful. So we begin with David. Sermon are not the, the, the lesson notes are also there for you. If you run those off, those can be very helpful. David, King David, is an incredibly important Old Testament figure, and he prefigures Jesus the Christ. In some ways, to understand Jesus, in some ways you have to understand David, because, of course, Jesus is from the house of David, from the root of the stump of Jesse. Jesse, of course, was David's father. If you look at the notes, um, David, King David, is mentioned 800 times times in the Old Testament, 60 times in the New Testament. In fact, in the Bible, in the Bible, the whole Bible itself, David's name is mentioned only slightly more than the name of Jesus. So David is a very important figure in the Bible. Many stories about David you probably already know from the anointing of David, from Samuel being chosen from his brothers that we'll look at today to David and Goliath, to this great relationship between David and Jonathan, to the sexual misconduct between David and Bathsheba, all of those great stories of adversity. David's life can be summarized in Acts chapter 13, verse 16. After David had served the purpose of God, he died. After David had served the purpose of God, he died. Um, one of the things that you can learn from that is that if God can take the checkered and scandalous life out of David and work in him and through him, God can also work through you. Your checkered life, whatever past that you have, God is more interested in your future than your past, as we know from the King David. Because David had a heart for God. One of the interesting things David is, is often said about David is he, he had a heart for God. Um, David, in, in some ways, at the best moments, at his best moments, said what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And, you know, there's a lot to learn from that with King David. Let me say a couple of things. You might want to take some notes on this. Some of the characteristics of David's life. David's life is exciting. By all means, David's life is exciting. His encounter with Goliath that we'll talk about next week is probably the best known biblical account of all time. People know the creation, people know Noah, people know the birth of Jesus, but David and Goliath has been used for many, many examples over the years of David with this small shepherd boy defeating Goliath, this huge adversary, with just what he had, a sling and a stone. David's story includes chance encounters in the caves and deserts and beautiful women and palace intrigue. 
There's last minute's escape. There's being chased by two kings, both Saul and Absalom, who was David's son. Um, David prevails over all of it to conquer and administer a huge empire in the Mediterranean. It is exciting. Second thing, David's story is inspiring. He's a mighty warrior. He inspires us also as a committed believer. It's interesting that the prolific songwriting that he did still inspires people 3,000 years later. His faith and insights really take up about half of the Psalms. He learned to trust God in the depths of his depression, in the extreme of danger, but he also knew how to offer high praises to God as David always points us to God. Third, David's story is human. David loves God, but he has tremendous character flaws that threaten to destroy his spirit and his family. In David, we see somebody who falls very low because his life is full of catastrophes. He has the death of a child. Um, the whole stuff with Bathsheba, the sexual abuse there is just overwhelming. But David also shows us how to hold on to God's love and grace and forgiveness. David is a second chance king who is ultimately restored and redeemed. People, uh, David points us to hope with God's mercy for ourselves. Four, David's story is manly. Many men of our church struggle with the notion that faith is primarily for women and children. But David's manly story shows how a great and mighty warrior and leader of men works to integrate his faith into his own life and to allow his faith to direct the outcome of his career. Fifth, David's story is morally challenging. David is guided by moral principles <clears throat> that find their root in God, but he rules righteously rather than selfishly even though when he focuses on himself, we see many instances where he's forced to pay the price. David lives in palaces and harems and giants and hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's a manly story, but underlying it all is a triumph of the moral guidelines that eventually bat him upside the head and keep him on the proper path. Six, David's story is ongoing. David chooses to be the ant. David, no, not David. God chose David to be the ancestor and the type of the Messiah, the son of David, son of God. It's foundational. The Davidic covenant is what we'll be talking about, um, that God will establish his kingdom through the lineage of David. So, Christ comes, Jesus comes from the lineage of David, from the house of David. So in some ways to understand Jesus, you need to understand David. So David is a, <clears throat> David is a first tier Old Testament figure up there with Abraham and Moses. He's a multifaceted, multi-gifted person. He was a musician um, writing the Psalms. He was also a worshiper. He didn't just write popular rap songs, he wrote songs of worship to God. David was also a nation builder. You may have run out of space if you're taking notes on that. David was a nation builder. Evil King Saul, right before David, functioned as a local king over a loosely organized group of tribes, kind of like Afghanistan. But through his own diplomatic efforts, David was able to unite these tribes into one nation. He built a palace and then he brought the Ark of the Covenant to reside in the new capital. Once he had consolidated power, he began to subdue his enemies like the Philistines, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Amorites. We'll learn about each one of those. And when he conquered the king of Zobah, the Armenian overlord of the kingdoms all the way to the east, to the Euphrates River, David became the king of a huge empire. David was a nation builder. Now the story of David, like I said, was taking place in mostly 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st Kings. It took place about 1000 BC. 
Um, take a while for that to sink in. 1000 BC. David lived and, lived and reigned 1000 BC. He wrote the Psalms 1000 BC. 3000 years ago, David was king. <clears throat> so, sorry about that. Um, we'll start with Saul, Israel's first king that you'll read about in the first parts of 1 Kings. It's a long story, but the people of Israel got tired of the judges. Remember that Moses had set up the judges. They got tired of the judges. They didn't like the prophets because the prophets were calling them to a lifestyle that was closer to God's than their own. They looked around and they saw, hey, all of our friends, all of our neighbors have a king. Why don't we have a king? So very reluctantly, Saul anointed uh, Samuel anointed Saul as king. The thing is, Saul had a bad heart. On the notes, you'll see Saul has a, a for Israel's first king, but he had a bad heart while David had a heart for God. Samuel's, Saul's first disobedience was in 1 Samuel 13, where Samuel told Saul to offer a burnt offering to God before the battle of the Philistine, but the prophet didn't come at the appointed time to offer the uh, sacrifice. So Saul offered the sacrifice himself just as Samuel was coming. <clears throat> so you can read chapter 13, verses 13 to 34, how Samuel gets so ticked off that Saul would go ahead and offer this kind of offering without him. So after this um, first disobedience, his second disobedience is in 1 Samuel 15, if you want to pause and read through that, 1 Samuel 15. You'll see there that the Amechalites were the arch enemy of Israel ever since they attacked the children of Israel while they were out wandering in the wilderness, escaping from Egypt under Moses. Saul was supposed to destroy everything of the Amechalites. Saul was given specific instructions to destroy and kill and loot and burn everything. You can read that in 1 Samuel 1, 15, 1 through 3. Saul didn't do that, though. Saul preserved the best cattle for himself. So in verses 10 to 17, um, Samuel shows up and he says, hey, where'd those cows come from? Where'd those sheep bleeding. And Saul said, well, we just kept those for ourselves. Saul was disobedient. He was looking out for himself rather than doing what God commanded. He shunned the commands of not only the prophet, but also God. So notice at that after that meltdown, Samuel is sent to Bethlehem in chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Samuel loves God, but God wants Samuel to dwell in the past and give Samuel a new mission. Samuel the prophet is going to anoint the new king. Now remember, this is going to be very difficult because Saul is still in power and Samuel is being called to anoint the new king. That's a dangerous thing to do when the current king is still alive. Duh, as if God didn't know. But God says, I want to choose a new king coming from one of Jesse's son, from the house of David, from the root of Jesse. So Samuel goes to Bethlehem, if you want to put a pause on and read chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3. What do you see in those verses? What does this story tell you about the importance of listening to God's voice? What does it tell you about how to, to discern the speaking of the Spirit? How does the Spirit, how does God's Spirit speak to you? How do you discern that? If you're with a group, maybe talk about that after this lesson. How, how do you discern what God is leading you and calling you to do? I know that God does that. Sometimes we put up shields, like I've talked about so many times at Zion, shield ourselves from the speaking of the Spirit. But if we took down those shields, how does God's Spirit speak to you? Because God chose small, insignificant David. 
kind of tells you about something about God. God using the small and insignificance. Notice that maybe God can use weakness. Maybe, maybe, may, just maybe God can use weakness. Small, insignificant, weak David. Small, insignificant, any one of us. Maybe God can use weakness in a way that serves God. Weakness makes us more dependent on God. Weakness sometimes makes us more prayerful. Weakness inhibits us from being proud and arrogant. Weakness helps us realize our need for fellowship with other people. Weakness sometimes makes us more sympathetic, empathetic toward the plight of others. When I am weak, then I am strong. That's, of course, what the Apostle Paul said. Think about how God might use your weakness in an, a way in which you can serve God. So, going on, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is in chapter 16, verses 12 and 13. This is very interesting. Saul and Samuel had been sitting waiting but when the boy David appears, God says to Samuel's spirit, this is a dude, this is a one, you've got to anoint this one. So Samuel gets up and pours oil on the boy's head. Anointing is a Hebrew word for Messiah. So the anointed Messiah is almost two ways of saying the same thing, anointed Messiah. It's not just anointing in the Old Testament, especially, is not just something that's symbolic. The, the perfume, the anointing uh, substance that they used was not only flowing over the head, but it had a pungent and durable perfume smell or aroma. Anointing was a fragrance that permeates. And if you got some of the anointing oil on your clothes, which you would because you anoint my head with oil, your clothes would reek. They would smell of that anointing oil, and oftentimes you couldn't even get it out, even with, with the best bleach. It left a permanent stains on your clothes, so it sticks with you is the point I'm trying to make. David is anointed twice for political reasons, also by the men of Judah in 2 Samuel, and later on by the tribes of Israel. And notice how the spirit, this is, will be interesting how the Spirit of God came mightily upon David. That's, that's a fascinating Old Testament start here with David, how the Spirit of God comes mightily on him. I have mentioned at Zion um, in sermons and in studies before how the Spirit of God in the Gospel of Luke, whenever you hear of in the New Testament about the Spirit of God coming on people. It's often from the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, of course, by the same author. And in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends in bodily form. Luke is the only one who says bodily form. Because in the Gospel of Luke, there's a substantive quality about the Spirit of God. It's not just this flapping little dubby spirit. It's a substantive quality that comes in and inhabits you. That's what happened with David, with his anointed. Um, remember in Psalm 51, David says, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Take, take not. Don't take your Holy Spirit. That substantive quality, don't take it. From me, meaning that there's that there's a spirit that, that that can come on people, like in like in Luke, like in this instance where David is anointed, where the Holy Spirit comes on and can leave. How can God spend take His Holy Spirit from you? At the same time, how can God send an evil spirit on to Saul? Very. Well, keep, keep with that, keep with that, because that will be an important part of what we'll be talking about in these next weeks. So in chapter 16, verses 14 through 23, David plays for Saul, the evil spirits came on Saul, his servants needed David to uh, provide music for this evil spirit of depression, or 
or, or anger or schizophrenia. We don't even know what it is. But David had um, a way of bringing music to Saul that was kind of a kind of a prescription drug that would take care of what I believe is Saul's mental illness. Took care of it in such that way. Um, now, on, at the bottom of that handout, two introduct these two introductory stories show us the importance of, number one, obedience. We learn a negative lesson from Saul and about the importance of careful obedience to the commands of God. When God calls you to do something, you do it. You don't do something else like Saul did when God says wipe out all the cattle. I mean, that's kind of a strange thing to even think about. All of the cattle, all the people, men, women, children. I mean, it, 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 that's a whole nother topic. That's a, that's a pretty dramatic thing God says. Saul says, I'll just keep the best for myself. That ain't going to happen if you're obedient to God. Um, second thing is it shows the importance of listening. From Samuel, we learn the importance of listening carefully to the voice of the Spirit. And when we listen carefully and take down that dream shield or voice shield from the working of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit can come upon us, speak to us, direct us, empower, inspire us. The, being responsive and open and listening to the Holy Spirit is key in developing one relationship with God. It also shows, number three, God's arrangements. We see how God uses second chances, working God's will. <clears throat> in David, sometimes we find ourselves in challenging situations. Oftentimes when we do, when we're in trials, we often ask ourselves, God, why is this happening to me? Why don't you take this away? Why is this happening? Where David's situation might tell us to ask, God, what can I be learning here? What can I be learning in this trial, in this horrible time? God, what are you trying to teach me? Not that God uses bad situations, but in bad situations, in tragic situations, we can learn how to become closer to God. That's what this whole lesson is about. These 10 weeks in David and 10 weeks in Psalms, 10 weeks in Isaiah, trials and triumphs. How to take some of the trials we face and turn them into triumphs and become closer to God. Next week, for next week, read 1 Samuel 17, the story of David and Goliath. It's an awesome lesson. I look forward to sharing that with you. Take care. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.